Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Miller. Um, I am the co-founder, uh, former CEO of Level Therapy. Um, Level Therapy is a mental fitness platform that provides treatment tools and video access to licensed psychotherapists. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about how to design for stigma, um, and more specifically, how to design for communities in which stigma is inherently a part of their experience, either online or offline. Uh, mental health, obviously, being a, a really strong application of that. Um, so first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, been in tech for over a decade. Um, was early at SurveyMonkey, um, working on the product um, and doing research as well. Um, wrote the uh, business plan uh, for a nonprofit called Black Girls Code, which is a, an educational platform that teaches um, uh, minority girls how to, to learn programming skills and STEM skills in general. Um, also worked at Salesforce as a, uh, a research manager, so managed all the market research at Salesforce. So all of our primary research that we did internally, um, as well as uh, relationships with um, uh, external researchers, so folks at Forrester, IDC, Gardner, et cetera. Um, spent some time at Stanford studying entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. Um, launched some products at StyleSeat as a consultant. Uh, StyleSeat's the largest uh, uh, beauty uh, marketplace in the United States. Uh, and most recently, about two and a half years ago, launched uh, Level Therapy. Um, and so, again, uh, wanted to focus on stigma uh, today and uh, really think it's an important um, topic that we discuss, not just because it's important for applications in, in healthcare. Um, I think if we're going to design solutions for some of the world's largest problems and use technology um, as a part of the solution, we're going to have to address uh, uh, some feelings and emotions that come um, out of stigma, uh, if not stigma itself. So stigma um, is inherently really just something that is uh, an embarrassment attached to a specific person, experience, or concept, but that sometimes manifests itself um, as anxiety or, or uh, fear on the, on, the, on the user. And again, so if we're going to focus on some of the world's largest problems, um, these feelings are going to be a part of uh, those communities. And so we need to start thinking about how to design um, amazing experiences for them um, while not spending that much time and money um, on, uh, on failures. Because if we, if we miss the mark, um, there could be pretty uh, uh, catastrophic consequences. Um, so I wanted to focus on who should be involved in the design process, um, why it's an important uh, design goal, which I focused on a little bit, um, and then uh, some methodology, so how to go about this. All right, so uh, level therapy was born um, out of a problem that I had myself. And so level therapy is the second company that I've launched. And while I was managing my first, it uh, wasn't going so well. It was my first at bat. Um, and I was transitioning into a caretaker role for a family member. And I just had way too much going on. And for the first time in my life, I started to experience a lot of anxiety. Um, and so for the first time in my life, I, I thought that uh, maybe I should try to speak to a therapist. And so I tried a competitor's uh, app and had an awful experience. Uh, it was completely web-based. Um, I had to choose from a list of therapists uh, before I actually spoke to anyone. Uh, and I was given a homework assignment uh, on the back end of the initial session, uh, which left me feeling more like a number than a person. Um, and as you can imagine, if you're in that state and you go through all of these, uh, these barriers, whether they're, they're psychological or social or financial, to actually speak to a therapist, the last thing you want is to have a very off-putting experience initially. Uh, and so instead of going back and uh, booking a second session, uh, I put together a team and started working on a solution. Uh, this is my co-founder, uh, Coley Williams. She's a, a licensed psychotherapist. Um, and so the very first step, uh, you know, as you might expect from my background, um, was uh, to start doing research, right? And you know, this has uh, been mentioned a little bit um, earlier today in some other talks, but it's extremely important, especially for communities that are experiencing uh, stigma, right? And so uh, on the supply side, on, on the therapist side, there wasn't that much stigma, but there was a lot of, uh, of unknowns uh, within the community. And so telemedicine is a really nascent application of, of psychotherapy uh, still today. And so a lot of our therapists had apprehension on how to provide treatment, um, whether or not empirically we can provide treatment through video conferencing, um, as well as if this was a HIPAA compliant platform, whether or not insurance um, would accept this, et cetera. Um, 
And these are all things that um, some of them we, we knew, um, just because my co-founder was a therapist, um, but also um, a lot of issues we didn't know. Um, and so a lot of folks were really unsure um, how to manage uh, themselves in a session if you know, the session went awry and, and the, the patient did something that was completely unprofessional, right? Um, there's liability within there, and so we had to, to research uh, and think um, a lot about how to design solutions for those therapists. Um, and additionally, with uh, the patients in the marketplace, as you might expect, uh, the stigma that exists is that people are embarrassed about um, what's happening with this data, who's getting access to my session or any of my health information. Um, if they have the opportunity to actually find the right therapist to speak to, um, and uh, you know, in the event that things don't work out, again, what happens with all their, their information? So there, there are significant privacy um, um, issues and, and concerns on the patient side. Um, so again, why is this uh, an important design goal? Um, because the current uh, state of mental health in the United States is worse than this guy. Um, no, but seriously, it's, it's really, really terrible. Um, and so it's the largest reason, stigma being the largest reason, that 26 million Americans don't access treatment each year in the United States, um, which leads to workplace stress uh, and other mental health issues, um, uh, contributing to 120,000 deaths per year and over $190 billion in healthcare costs. Um, and additionally, it, it limits productivity, right? So on the other end of folks potentially accessing treatment, um, obviously there's a lot of, of personal health, but in aggregate, um, there is a lot of, of financial benefit as well. And so we're leaving about $100 billion on the table in the United States because people don't address um, uh, the stigma that exists and actually access treatment. Okay, so... Um, for the remainder, I'm just going to start showing you guys a lot of our process when we were building the first iterations um, of this app. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be really vulnerable. Like, a lot of these designs were not good, but we needed to, in the effort to get things out uh, and learn as quickly as possible, we shipped them. Um, and they actually ended up uh, meeting the actual goals of our, of our patients, um, and we were able to get to a, a really strong place. Um, so this may sound very, very simple for everyone in this room, um, but the most important thing that I've learned is to, A, define, so spend a lot of time defining and then testing your assumptions. And the reason that I'm even including this in this presentation, um, I'll give you an anecdote. Yesterday I was talking to a friend, um, and she's working for a cryptocurrency company that raised a $100 million ICO, and they're about to release their product, and they still haven't tested anything out with any users. And it, it still happens in companies in Silicon Valley today. And it's absolutely ridiculous if we're actually going to believe that we can uh, provide users with an actual solution that they're going to use without getting their input and starting to uh, ask them questions before we start um, being visionaries and, and designing things in an ivory tower. And by this, I mean all of them. So not just designing uh, or testing one major assumption that is contingent on or, or really the goal of your entire business. Um, it tests everything. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're going to have to design a process around this. Um, this isn't going to be something that is comfortable um, or is a short process. Um, but you owe it to the people that are paying you or, or, or you're providing a service to, um, to go through these steps. Um, so very early on, um, some of the methods that we used um, were surveys. So quantitative and qualitative as well. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, being an ex Survey Monkey employee, we use Survey Monkey a ton. Um, uh, I think uh, for folks that don't have a strong research background, um, they have a great product that allows you to uh, design surveys that are strong from a methodology standpoint. Uh, so you don't run into errors um, of really not uh, having uh, strong insights for the survey that you designed because it wasn't, um, uh, uh, from a methodology standpoint, sound. Um, and Lookbook, or Look Back, is a, uh, a great app that we used. Um, and this is actually a screenshot of the video. This is a friend of mine. He works at Google X. Uh, and we, it, this is a service that you use. Um, and you programmatically add a couple lines of code. You can do it within a day. Um, and it allows the mobile user, and I think they have a web product as well, um, to their front camera turns on, but not the light. So 
their, their face is being recorded while they're, they're using your app. Um, and so you know, if you ask them to kind of talk through what they're thinking, you get a lot of insight, right? So you get uh, uh, some nonverbal communication, but you also get verbal communication because they're telling you uh, how they feel about what they see and what they're thinking. Um, uh, and this was something that was extremely important for us um, just because we were able to see people um, without being in the same room um, and how they felt about using our product. Um, and if you can, obviously, uh, best case is, is to be in the same room with them. Um, but you know, this is not uh, always feasible. But um, ideally, if you can, uh, it's great to see and watch people's errors, um, depending on if it's a mobile product or a web product, um, just to see what they try first, just to try to understand what their behavior is going into your, their product um, or your product um, and, and how well uh, the usability is. Uh, and some pro tips. Uh, so make sure that you uh, build a broad uh, sample. And so by that, I mean um, uh, making sure that uh, all potential types of users that may use your product are represented in, uh, in the research, right? And so not just folks um, you know, that are, are early adopters or um, what have you, making sure that you spend time on designing um, a broad representation uh, of the sample. Um, and secondly, uh, sometimes you can't beat the control. And so you see this blue app, um, this blue color, this blue gradient here. Um, and trust me, I tried so hard to, to not ship this. But we could, in, in doing research, we literally could not beat um, the blue control. And so uh, especially early on, uh, I think this is important to, to think about uh, and take in mind um, or take into account just because uh, you may not knock it out of the park and uh, create something revolutionary the first time around, right? And you need to make sure that if your goal is to ship something quickly and get to the next step, that, um, that that's the goal. And so if you have enough and the control is, is beating all the things that you have designed, it's time to move on. Um, and playing roulette, um, which is the, the opposite of this, is, is, is an affordance that is for growth companies. And by roulette, I mean um, being able to test many different um, small things just to see where Lyft comes from, right? Not just um, you know, things, that, things that may not even be uh, that important. So right, the color of the smiley face, the color of the welcome, the color of the button, the font, um, uh, the fill of the button, et cetera. Um, those things may have lifts, right? But if you don't have time and budget and resources uh, to test those things, um, do not waste time on it at all. And it, I mean, most later stage companies don't do this at all, um, but some do and they see significant lift from it. Um, but again, it's an affordance of being a later stage company. Um, so this is an actual quote that I said while we were designing this initial, uh, <laughs> this initial iteration. Um, and my goal was to uh, make sure that as a team that we uh, were designing a solution that uh, evoked trust uh, and professionalism, but also a sense of progressiveness. Right? So we wanted to make sure that we leaned into making sure that people were feeling comfortable giving uh, us their data and also using uh, the, the product and the service. But we were also kind of pushing telemedicine forward. And we weren't doing things that uh, existed offline or, or already existed in other, in other products. Um, and so I'm going to take you through the onboarding flow and the initial um, uh, session and, and kind of what happens after the session um, and kind of give you guys some feedback on what happened after launch. Um, so this is uh, some of the onboarding flow. Uh, it's a little blurry. I apologize for that. Um, but again, we, we talk to our customers in a very conversational tone um, in effort to build trust. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that they understood that we were there for them, um, that we were there to help, um, and that they had the opportunity to talk from anywhere, that they weren't constrained to uh, having internet. And so by being a mobile product, they could be wherever they were comfortable. So whether that's a park, uh, the beach, uh, you know, their bedroom, um, on a lunch break, um, it, it, was, it was perfectly fine for us. Um, and that we cared about them, which I think is um, uh, really important to say and, and state from uh, as early uh, as you can in the process when you're dealing with uh, stigmatized communities. Uh, this is our early dashboard. Um, there's only one interaction, only one button here, really. Uh, so when people click Get Started, we enter them into uh, an intake, uh, a chat with one of our licensed specialists. And so we ask them seven questions to understand what they're experiencing, what brought them to the app, so that we can actually tailor their experience from there. Um, and this was extremely important and 
something that none of our competitors uh, did or, or still do today. Um, and it, it allows us to get a sense of whether or not patients have an or a sense of the type of therapist they want to work with, whether that be someone from a particular um, ethnicity or, or religion or uh, uh, sexual preference, et cetera. Um, all these things are important when you're trying to build um, an amazing experience for, for folks in, in, in a stigmatized community. Um, here's a photo of the, the chat. One of our therapists, uh, they would actually have the session um, after going through the, uh, the initial intake process. Um, and lastly, after every single session, we asked them how it went. Um, so comparable to Uber, uh, we just want to get a sense of how well we're doing with the matching process. Um, and this also serves as a, a first uh, uh, point in which if there was an issue with the session, uh, we get alerted immediately. Um, and so after that uh, first iteration was finished, we uh, launched and learned. And so we launched in September of 2016. Um, the data that we got was consistent with the research, um, which was uh, great and obviously a benefit from going through the process early on. Um, but we did understand that there were some new issues that, um, that, that, that came up, uh, and they were still attached to um, the stigma. And so it was um, uh, really, uh, it manifested in people going through the entire onboarding process um, and going through the intake process and giving us a lot of information about themselves, but not booking um, an initial session. And the initial consultation is free. And so uh, we knew that the magic was within the session. And so throughout research, every time a person actually got uh, within a session with a therapist, they felt a connection and they were uh, more engaged and they were like, oh, OK, I believe this could actually work now. I feel something. Um, and so we lowered the barriers as low as possible to try to get people to that point within the app. And so through download all the way through the intake process, um, we saw high conversion. But people wouldn't book that free consultation for some reason. And um, we dug into that. And uh, it ended up being that a lot of people still, even after us matching them with a person that they let us know they would like to speak to, um, they were still uncomfortable with um, speaking to a therapist, even on their phone. And so that led us to make a really challenging decision. Um, and instead of being a transactional service where we provide you know, one on one sessions, uh, we kind of pivoted towards a, a SaaS business and, and built a product for people to to manage uh, certain disorders if they didn't want to speak to a therapist, but also still have uh, the entire practice. So if people wanted to speak to a therapist, they absolutely could. Um, and so that solution um, looked completely different, um, spent a, a lot of time on it, but um, it ended up increasing a lot of engagement, um, the bottom line as well, because uh, we're now a subscription-based business. Um, and for folks that aren't ready to speak to a therapist, we now have an option uh, for them, which is great. Uh, and here are some of those, uh, those slides. And so we redid the, redid the entire onboarding flow. Uh, same copy. But um, the, the dashboard and the home page was completely different. And so um, we decided to rebrand ourselves as a mental fitness platform. So instead of talking about mental health, which is already stigmatizing, uh, we kind of reframed how people think about mental health. Um, huge fitness trend going on around the world right now, uh, especially in the United States. Um, uh, and so we decided to brand ourselves as a mental fitness platform, um, which has been working. Uh, and so within the dashboard, uh, people are allowed to now rate how they're going throughout their day. Um, they have access to that data so they can see um, how well they're doing either uh, any particular day or days that they have sessions, et cetera. Um, they could actually go through and have uh, a session. We have psychoeducation uh, within the dashboard as well. So we have a lot of long form content and video content uh, for people to get access to if they have any questions around uh, said disorder or the entire process. Um, again, an effort to educate people um, before they actually enter a session or enter a treatment if they want to. Uh, we have assessment quizzes. And so if someone uh, decides to come to uh, the app and they have no idea where they are on the spectrum of uh, what they're experiencing, uh, we do have questionnaires um, and assessments for uh, anxiety, depression, and, uh, and bipolar within the app. Um, again, just to give people a benchmark of, uh, of what they're experiencing from a quantitative standpoint so they can make an educated decision about uh, their health care. Uh, and so for folks that decide that they do want to go through uh, and use some of the products, um, 
I'm not going to show you all those designs um, it's because we haven't shipped all of them, but um, this is the general design, um, and it is uh, more educational. Um, we try to include video to normalize the experience of them seeing a person um, providing education through the, the app, um, which I think is uh, extremely important. Um, but uh, again, this is a solution from those learnings uh, uh, post-launch. Um, and lastly, I know these takeaways may sound uh, very, very simple, but uh, I, I'm reiterating on them just because uh, I still see this, um, regardless of the stage of the company um, uh, being done. And I think it's a, 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 a really big mistake. Um, and I think that we're leaving a lot of, uh, of growth on the table, and we're not really addressing a lot of the issues that uh, a lot of our customers have. Um, and that is it. <laughs>